Okay, so uh, I did some dynamic readjustment of the of the talk based on uh, the fantastic talks I've seen for for two days. So so we'll sort of see where this goes. So I am a part of the Sea Science Institute. We we have a logo. We have a URL. I advise you to go and check it out. There's a, a blog. There's lots of information we try to put on there, and we try to keep it up to date. And if you have any feedback or comments on what we can do to make it more useful, that'd be great too. So I I, I bumped this slide forward. Uh, and I'll, I'll return to it again later, but, but an observation I made broadly before I sort of get into anything is that there will always be experiments and there will always be data that are outside of the managed environments that are always going to be doing things off to the side, right? And so what my interest is is, is how, to, how to catch those, how to, how to do something useful for those. And so I'm, I'm, I think it's complementary to all the approaches that sort of say, you know, uh, uh, if we can convince scientists to, to work in this, in this environment then we get all these services, I'm kind of wondering about, you know, when, when you can't, what can you do? And so my observation here, or, or, you know, and the key idea here is that, you know, free experimentation, and free meaning like in terms of dollars, right, being able to sort of run something and then change it and then run it over again many, many, many times is a really nice property of software, right? You can't do that if you're building bridges. You can't do that if you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, what kind of load can this bridge take before it, it falls over. You can't, you know, driving bigger and bigger trucks over it until, you know, the old joke is you just drive a bigger and bigger truck over it until it collapses and you rebuild it and that's how, that's how much weight it can carry. All right, so it's very expensive to do that. With, with software, we have this really nice ability to sort of do anything we want whenever we want, throw libraries together from all over, use various languages and so on. And so I, I think we should be conservative about over-constraining that process in the name of reproducibility. And, and another observation I guess I make that I didn't put on the slide is that, you know, search engines don't say we're only going to index the data you know, the web pages that conform to the standards, right? They sort of do the best they can with whatever's, whatever's given to them. And I think, we, I think there's a, a lesson there as well. Okay. Uh, another, another sort of corollary of this, I guess, is that, you know, maybe, maybe there's no difference. I, I claim there's no difference really between debugging, testing, and production experiments, at least in this world, right? It's like when, when it fails, it's a, it's a, it was just debugging. Once it works, well, that was my experiment. And so, you know, maybe you guys, I'm, I'm willing to, willing to uh, discuss this, but, if you believe that, then I think that the only choice is to have sort of post hoc approaches. You want to be able to say, ah, it just worked. Let me sort of capture what I did after the fact. It can't be that I have to sort of always anticipate what's going to work and what's not. Okay. So in general, I'm sort of interested broadly in things that can tolerate messy, heterogeneous code and data, and in particular data because I'm a database guy. So uh, that, I'll sort of end on that. Um, we heard T Tony talk eloquently about the fourth paradigm, so I won't, I won't belabor this, but really e-science is about data. It's not just about computational science. It's really about this data-driven notion, okay? And so some of these data sets are really, really large. You get, uh, quote, next generation sequencing, which is sort of, whoops, which is sort of a silly, uh, oh gosh, I hope this doesn't auto-advance to the whole thing. I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not really next generation anymore. It's sort of current generation, you know, maybe high throughput sequencing, but that can, Maybe pull down 200 terabytes a week, uh, but you have to be careful with the numbers because really there's the, the raw luminosities out of these machines are sort of something that nobody ever looks at. And so when you want to put up big numbers on the slide, you say 200 terabytes a week, but really it's smaller than that. But it can still get quite large. You know, the, the, the large synoptic survey telescope will be uh, pulling down three terabytes a night. And so every three days it will collect as much as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey project that Tony discussed, which, which is sort of revolutionized astronomy in terms of being a data-driven science example. This is, this is many orders of magnitude more. Uh, and also as a temporal component. Okay, so some of these problems is where we, where, we like to, where we like to work in. And so there's lots of ways to tell this sort of data deluge story, and it's been, it's been done before, but this is my favorite way to tell it. Where, you know, may, maybe the old model was one of querying the world, where, where your data acquisition activities were coupled to a specific hypothesis, right? You came up with your hypothesis, then you went out and did an experiment to gather the data that might answer it, and then you analyze the data, then you go publish the paper. But increasingly what you're seeing is sort of, you know, download the world en masse, put it into some sort of a database, and then do your... Uh, hypothesis testing against the database. And so this is a very different model for many scientists in many disciplines. And so I gave some examples of astronomy. You see this happening in oceanography with bigger and bigger, higher and higher resolution models, uh, cheaper and cheaper sensors. You know, there's this Argo project from several years, from many years ago where they sort of toss these droves out in the ocean and just let them go wherever they were for all around, you know, all around the, the world following the currents. Uh, so it was sort of a, you know, they weren't sure what they were going to find, which was a very data-driven approach. Uh, and so on. So I gave these two examples. This one's kind of fun. This is a, a environmental sample processor, an ESP from um, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. It does wet lab chemistry in situ. So you drop this thing out in the ocean and water flows in one side and chemical, chemical assays come out the other so you can count the critters and so forth. It's like a robot. 
a pretty amazing piece of engineering, right? I mean, they had to sort of ruggedize this thing to stand up to, to ocean currents. But it's a very different model, too, because you're, you're sort of automated away the lab tech, right? It's like you're getting continuous results from this instrument, what used to take sort of two weeks per, you know, per test. In a similar vein, this, this is, these are pictures from this thing called a flow cam, which uh, is a ruggedized digital camera uh, equipped with some image processing software. So water flows, it's also in situ. Water flows by and it snaps pictures of the critters and tries to identify them automatically. And so I used to put a thing on the bottom of the slide where, you know, fr from Flowcam's company's website, it was, you know, collect more data exponentially faster with Flowcam or something. And it was like, sort of struck me that that's, that's, their, that's their goal, really. It's just to fill up their, your hard drive as fast as they can, right? They're not, they don't, they don't say anything about what you're supposed to do differently now that you have a hard drive full of images. And so the old model for getting these same kind of images was, you know, you go out on a ship that costs $20,000 a day, you know, take a sample from somewhere, freeze it, bring it back to the lab, thaw it out, put it under the microscope, you know, use your knowledge to sort of tag it, and now you have sort of one or two images. And so here are these stories of people that did their entire PhD dissertation on sort of five or six of these things, and now they're collecting, you know, thousands every, you know, hour or something like that. So the whole process of how to interact with this data has to change, and that's what this e-science thing is all about in, in my mind. Okay. So it's not just about scale is the other point of that. It may not be, it may be gigabytes you're talking about, but it can still be a completely different process for how you do the science. And so it's still, a, it's still sort of a big data problem, even if it's not petabytes. All right, so we have a whole bunch of projects in this space. This is basically a list of things I'm not going to talk about, but I wanted to sort of mention that I do a lot of stuff in various areas. So there's a lot of visualization and cloud stuff, uh, sort of long tail science and scientific data integration with this messy data thing. And recently we've been doing some, uh, some uh, that I have advancing is going to kill me. The, uh, some work on graph databases that I think is pretty interesting with, uh, with Pacific Northwest National Lab. And I'll touch on this data markets thing, hopefully, if I have a little bit of time, which is kind of fun. Uh, so the, I think another key observation for the rest of this talk is that, you know, e-science is really sort of married to this idea of the cloud, right? Scalable computing and storage for everybody is sort of a key enabler of data-driven discovery. This is a, a cover from an aging copy of Business Week uh, from a student that was at UW who went to Google and then engineered a project to get these uh, Hadoop clusters available to all the universities so, so, people, so they could train students on how to work with really large data sets. Um, Google has cloud offerings, obviously Microsoft Azure, and then Amazon. And, and in my, many of my examples will come from Amazon because they sort of represent a one particular flavor of cloud computing, uh, but they're not, they're not the only player in this space. Okay, so the point of this talk is maybe just explore the roles that the cloud can play in reproducible research. And we've obviously heard people mention this here and there. Uh, so I don't want to belabor anything that's too obvious. Uh, so I guess warn me if I'm doing that. And then maybe, maybe sort of in the back of your mind, consider, you know, what if, what if we just did everything in the cloud? What if everything always, you know, data was born in the cloud, your code was born in the cloud, and so on? Would that, would that change anything? Okay. So I had, a, I had sort of a whole bunch of background slides on cloud, but I, I, from hearing people sort of mention it here and there offhand, I don't know if I really need to dwell on that too much. So uh, hopefully this will sort of cover it. But I like, to, I like to show this one, and this is not my slide. I'm stealing it from... Uh, Werner Vogel with Amazon, but this is in the basement of uh, a factory somewhere, and this thing is a generator, but you can tell that it's probably not being actively used as a generator because there's sort of ambient lighting and people in suits and ties and sort of, sort of art on the walls, right? And so this is now a, a meet and greet room, and this is a conversation piece that they have in here. And so why, why am I showing this slide? Or why does Werner show this slide? And why am I stealing his, his, his ideas? Well, the idea of a factory needing to generate their own electricity, at some point in time, it became cost effect, more cost effective to outsource that, right? To let somebody else generate electricity and just pipe it in. And they don't really need to generate it anymore. It's a conversation piece. It's, an antiqu it's a quaint idea. The claim is, and I sort of believe it, is that computing is going that way as well. Right, the idea of buying your own servers to put in your own lab or put in your own closet and hire your own people to do, to do it, supply your own power and your own cooling for them, is eventually going to be a quaint idea. It's going to be sort of, you know, tablets and the cloud, and that's about it. There'll be niche, niche cases, just like a hospital, just like certain niche uh, applications need their own generator, like a hospital. Certainly there'll be a, your own computing, but in general, most of us won't be doing it. That's, that's my claim, and we can debate that if you don't agree. So, but, but, the, but the main idea here is, one is to be provocative and sort of give that point out, but also just to give the idea that it's utility computing. And I have another slide that I took out, but uh, this is a very old idea. You got uh, John McCarthy from 1961 predicting the future of utility computing where you would just plug in and get gas computing. And it sort of seems to be happening now. Okay. 
Uh, the other point I want to make about cloud is that it's mainstream, right? It's not an esoteric thing. It's not sort of a, a niche thing. It's not something that you should wait four years to start ex experimenting with. And one example of that was just a couple of weeks ago at, at, S at Sigmod in Athens, James Hamilton from Amazon uh, made the point that they buy enough computing resources every day to power the entire Amazon.com infrastructure as of 2001. So it's an in indirect way of saying that they're, they're, they're buying more computing than you can imagine. And the reason they're doing that is because they're actually, because people are using it, people are buying it, right? So this isn't sort of a, a new unproven idea. It's very, very mainstream. Another, another way of putting this is there's really no startups at all that don't use some form of cloud computing. It just doesn't make a lot of sense if you have two people, you know, two co-founders who have a good idea to go start buying a bunch of computers. It just, it just makes no sense to do that. They're, they're going to start off in the cloud. So it's, anyway, so that may be obvious to some of you. I hope it is, actually. But it's, it's, sometimes the comments I get back are, well, this is, this is too new. You know, I'm not really sure I should be using this yet. It's sort of, that, that point was two or three years ago. It's, it's, it's definitely mainstream. OK. So we talked about virtualization. I think everybody sort of knows what virtualization is and virtual machines and so on. Uh, I just want to give this anecdote because I think it's kind of fun. But in 2007, I was sort of had a project uh, where we were building this thing called the Ocean Appliance. And so this was trying to have software and hardware and everything in a box for a particular application that I'll tell you about. Well, the, the application was sort of shipboard computing, right? And so this was for the management of research cruises. Uh, and there was sort of a tenuous wireless connection between the ship and shore because it would go out of range and so on. And so you needed to have some, some local computation. And so originally the view was, well, we'll just write some software and then the ship, the ship sysadmin, which there is one, there's computing obviously on these ships, we'll sort of install our software and sort of manage it. And it quickly became clear that it was just sort of cheaper and easier and, and, and uh, uh, safer to assemble an entire computer in the lab and just drop the thing off so they could plug it into Ethernet and plug it into power and just do everything locally. Um, and so that's, so that's what we tried to do. And so, so we did this. So what are some of the responsibilities of it? We actually stuck this thing underneath the little the lab bench there, and you could connect to it from your, from your laptops and so on. Uh, and it was in this, the, the little uh, science room of the, of the RV barns. And this is a very small ship. We also deployed on some larger ships. And it did, it, did, it did a few things. It did sort of ship to ship and ship to shore telemetry, right? So we had some data shipping back and forth so the people, the people on the shore side could watch what was going on in the ship and sort of respond to things. And sometimes you had to make multiple hops to make that, to make that work, right? And so this thing managed that. It also sort of piped back model results for the local area you were in, and so that was kind of fun. It also did sort of event detection where you could sort of set alerts where, you know, if, if certain values uh, went over a certain amount, it would sort of send an email or, or light up or something. And so one of these events might be this, this, this red water, which is not, not red tide, by the way. Red tide is a poison thing. This isn't poisonous, so it's important not to, we got dinged for that. Uh, but it is, it is quite noticeable, right? This is the Columbia River Estuary, and it's got these big swirls of red stuff, and it's this little guy called Mirianecta rubra. Uh, and so the chlorophyll spikes when you see that, and so it might be nice. So anyway, so there's a lot of interesting shipboard computation we wanted to put into one unit. So why am I telling this story? Well, again, it was easier, cheaper, and safer to build the box and lab and hand it out for free. Well, you don't really need the hardware in too many applications. This one we did because we we're actually putting it on a ship and the, and the connection to the Internet. But nowadays, really what you would do is, is build a virtual machine, right? But the point is, is everybody should be in the business of doing this, right? Package up all your stuff you're going to need and deliver that as one unit as opposed to one library, right? And then, and then allow, allow your users to figure out all the dependencies and so on. And we've heard this story several, several times from various people. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if, if only there was some project that would focus on <laughs> code and data and environment, then we... Yeah, and, and, this, and this is fantastic. I mean, an, an analog to this is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pushing a little further. And again, this isn't even my work. Right? This is virtual machines I'm talking about. This is not even something that I'm working on specifically. So pushing a little further down the stack to catch more of the environment. But I think there's obviously a place for CDE, where, which is a much more targeted uh, delivery package. But the same idea applies. You know, don't, don't, don't leave it up to everybody else to sort of solve those problems for you. Get something that completely works in one unit and ship that out. And I think it's not just easier for them. It's not just like due diligence. It's cheaper for you. You don't have to answer the phone, right, and, and walk them through the process of getting the software installed. And so I think we, we should all be in the business of doing this as part of reproducible research. Yeah. What happened to the shipment then, or what was he doing before this? Oh no! He, well, so there's tons of other systems he has to manage. I mean, they have sensors that are that are bit, that are always there on the on the ship, and they, you know, bring the data in and clean it up and sort of put it into a standard web interface for the ship where people. There's email that goes through, and there's a this thing called High Seas Net, which is a satellite uh, internet connection that takes a little bit of administration. Um, there, there's a, there's there's enough duties 
information duties to hire kind of a, and I shouldn't even call this a sad man, sort of a, uh, I don't remember what they quite call them, maybe they do call them a sad man, but the sort of information technology role, you know, there's somebody, there's, there's a marine techs that deal with the sensors themselves, but there's sort of a computing guy, or person, I shouldn't say guy, um, and, and there's, there's definitely enough work for them to do. But, but the, other, the other problem is just a security one. I mean, they can't let anything onto the ship's system at all, right, because it could actually affect navigation or something like that. So they, we couldn't, you know, you can't just say, oh, install some software that I wrote. <laughs> and so this, this worked out well. Um, okay, so the, I guess the, the, another, another thread here is that, fine, so virtualization is code plus data plus environment. But there's, there's another piece, right, we've, we, and, and we've heard it come up in some of these talks, is that, well, where do you run this thing? Just because you have a virtual machine, what's, what's the resources I need to run it? And that's something else that the cloud does provide, right? You don't have to worry about this so much. So it's really code plus data plus environment plus a platform to run it on, uh, pl plus some, so some add-on services to make this easier, right? So some services for managing VMs, I'll, I'll mention that briefly. Uh, you know, it's security and reliability and availability are sort of theoretically done for you. You know, you're not sort of having to worry about that so much. There's services for processing really big data, maybe outside of your particular experiment that you're trying to let people reuse, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about that, um, and so on. Okay. All right, so there are some challenges, though, and that's uh, what I want to, those are the two other big bullets in the, uh, in the, in the overall talk is one is, what, how much does all this cost, right? What is, this, is this affordable for, for the applications that we're talking about? And then for really, really big data or other kinds of data intensive science, what, what, what needs to change? So it's not just everything's all in one nice VM that you can move around and, and run. What happens when you have, have larger things? I can talk about that. So what, what I'm not, not going to talk about, what people have, typically have questions about about cloud are, are security and privacy, long-term preservation, and sometimes, well, will anybody actually use this because they want ownership of their local computers? And we can discuss that, and they're, they're, they're interesting robots, but I'm not going to talk about them in the talk. Okay. All right, so some observations about this stuff. We just, we already talked about this one. Um, second observation is, we, I guess we already talked about as well, is that you need this platform as well. You know, download it to my laptop is, is insufficient. So one simple example is, you know, de novo assembly, which is instead of taking a bunch of, taking uh, reads off of one of these uh, uh, sequencers, and instead of aligning it to a known genome, you try to assemble it from scratch because you don't know what's there. For example, in this, in this area called metagenomics, um, they're trying to po profile entire populations rather than sort of zoom in on one particular organism, and so they really don't know what's there. But if you, you know, statistically, you can sort of look at the overlap of all these reads and maybe reconstruct longer contigs. And so this process, uh, I'm actually, I'm actually usually on the other side of this argument, trying to argue with these people that they don't actually need really big memory machines to do this, so you can actually scale this out and do this in a parallel way, but for the time being, the state of the art is sort of to get really big memory machines and, and do it. So you can't rerun this experiment by downloading a VM and running on your laptop, at least most of these people's experiments. Okay. Um, you know, another observation is that experiment environments might span multiple machines. It's not just, not just, not, and not just for scalability reasons, but for sort of uh, uh, application architecture reasons, right? You might have a database server and a cluster of a, of a few machines running some big, some model, and then maybe a web server for sort of doing the visualization or something like that. And if you want to repackage that experiment so someone else can use it, it's probably, it may not be feasible to sort of wrap it up all in one VM, okay? So that's a challenge. So this is another service that the cloud, whoops. Too much doctoring of a, uh, oh, this is, sorry, no, this is right. So. So an example of this might be this uh, observation and forecasting system that uh, I, I, I worked with a, at a previous job, and Juliana knows a lot about this. She's been working at the same group. But, you know, they bring in force, they suck down forcings every day uh, from various websites, you know, title information, a river discharge, and they put it on a file system, and that goes, some, of, some of that goes into a relational database. And then through Perl and Cron, they kick off all these Fortran uh, uh, models uh, to predict you know, solve the Navier-Stokes equations and, and predict the, the, the river dynamics. And then generate a bunch of data products and, and pump those out over the web. And so you can imagine that allowing someone to reproduce this is a reasonable thing to try to do, but it's simply not feasible without, A, without some kind of a virtualization, but B, without something that's kind of, can, you know, it's not going to be one virtual machine very likely. Okay. So there is a... Uh, one of the services that, so Amazon recognized this problem, and one of the services they provide is a thing called cloud formation, where you can sort of launch and configure ensembles of, of related virtual machines as a unit. And so you can describe them with this little simple JSON uh, kind of file format where you say, well, these are all going to use the same security key pair, 
and I'm going to have these instances in them that have these metadata properties, and I'm going to call it all, I'm going to refer to the whole thing as, the, you know, or, or I guess let's see, the outputs. I'm actually not sure what outputs means in this, in this context. The point is you can give a little description of this, fire that off, and it'll launch everything as one unit, configure all the IP addresses as you specified, so you don't have to go in there and, and you know, make everything point to each other again. And that's, that's, a, that's a, an added service that you're not likely to sort of build for yourself on, on, on your laptop or just with VMware, right? It's sort of, it's sort of married to the cloud, okay? Uh, so, so one of my favorite use cases for, for cloud is Google Docs for developers. And what I mean by that is, you know, so Google Docs and, and also now with Microsoft's uh, live office products, you know, you can you go online and you can both be editing the same document at once and you can see each other's changes in real time and so forth. And this is a very nice, uh, uh, you know, improvement over sort of emailing copies of a file around. So wh why do we need an analog of that for developers? Well, you know, we, we sometimes when you have... Well, let me, tell you the, let me tell you the example, and we'll go back to the, to the generalization of it. So example was we had some money from this Ocean Observatories initiative, which is a really big NSF grant, but it needed to be spent by sort of January 1st, and we got it in like in October or something like that. So we had three, three months to spend the money, so we needed to ramp up very quickly. And so we spent two weeks fooling around between sysadmins on both sides, just debating about who was going to give you, you know, reciprocal accounts on which machines, right? So, so you have to sort of crack through firewalls and give somebody a guest account on the machine. Does the guest account have enough privileges to actually get to the data we need and so on? And so what you can do, though, is just in, a, in 10 minutes, spin up an Amazon instance, open to the world, essentially, you know, let two people SSH into it, and you can be operating on the exact same code base. Right? And this just sort of elegantly solves it. It's, it's temporary, right? It's transient. We're just trying to get started and get some debugging going. We don't necessarily need this to be a permanent, permanent thing. So it just takes a lot less overhead. And further, this, this is sort of important, you know, implication of this is that in this kind of environment, there's no, it's impossible to close a bug as can't replicate. Right? You're both, you're both looking at the exact same place. If one person has the problem, the, the owner of the code can also see the problem, right? Because they can log in and look at exactly, so it's just like run this command to see the error that I'm seeing and then they can go fix it for you. As opposed to this, email exchange that I'm sure we've all had with each other. Uh, you know, try this, no wait, try this. Well, did you check this? Can you send me the output of this command? You know, that's one of my favorite, right? It's like, just, just run the damn thing. Just, okay, so this sort of only solves that. So I like, I like this use case a lot. And I think this is sort of a, a, a has a role to play in reproducible research. Okay, and you see other people doing this as well. They, uh, the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle uh, uses these virtual machines for sort of collaborative development of their pipelines. All right, so. I guess, it, has anything been, been strikingly controversial yet? No. Okay, good, all right. So, the, so then maybe some open questions are, what, what, is all this, what is all this gonna cost us? So, you know, who, who should pay for this reprodu reproducibility? Who should, who should shoulder this reproducibility burden, right? The cost of hosting the code, the cost of hosting the data, which I separate from the code because sometimes it's big, uh, and then the cost of actually executing the code. And so it, I, I think reproducibility, I think, so typically what we say is you, you, them, and I think that's true in the cloud too. It just it sort of allows a more, more uh, a, you know, it allows more applications to fit this. Okay. Yeah, I guess I don't want to necessarily, necessarily uh, deep this here, but the, the main idea is that, is that, you know, if you host your data and you host your VMs as, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an, say, an Amazon machine image, somebody else can get on and swipe their credit card and run it on the cloud. Right? No installation, no anything, but, but they pay for it, which is sort of nice. As opposed to you setting up an infrastructure, which a couple of people mentioned, like, oh, it's very difficult for me at the university to set up an infrastructure where, you're, where I'm going to allow other people to come on and reproduce my experiments on my resources. Right? That's expensive. Does that make sense? And so this, allows, this sort of shifts the burden a little bit. So this you and you is still potentially expensive, though, and that's what we can sort of talk about. Zooming up a step, is the cloud fundamentally going to be cost effective? You know, the, the, the answer is, I, I think, Unquestionably, yes, right? I think it's going to, I think it, it, it's, it's clear it's going to drown out uh, any sort of savings you can get in local computation. So some of the uh, numbers from this report that's now a couple of years old from, from Berkeley, this is the ratios over here in the right-hand column of cost in a, in a very large data center versus a medium-sized data center, let alone sort of a local thing. And so, you know, thousands of servers per administrator versus sort of 140 per administrator. I suspect that your ratio at local universities are lower than that though, right? It's probably more like 20 servers per administrator or something. Okay, and similar sort of numbers there. So I think 
the, the economy scares are, 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 are very real. And actually, I have, I have a whole bunch more slides on this, but, I, but I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna belabor it, uh, unless somebody wants me to. The, the other key, uh, or the, the, the uh, yeah, so the key and the reason why the costs are what they are is one, one is that the economy is a scale, right? You can sort of, uh, uh, you know, one thing James Hamilton likes to say is that there's entire teams of people with 10, 15 people that think only about power delivery in the data center, right? We can't afford to optimize power delivery in, in our server rooms the way, the way they can. Okay, so this thing scales up. But the other key idea is that utilization is not constant, right? Especially not in, in this area. And so these uh, figures are also from this same report. And this is sort of a company, sort of a corporate view, so, but, but you can imagine mapping, uh, and I, I can explain how to map in you know, more of a scientific workload to this. But you imagine that there's some sort of seasonality or periodicity to your workload. And then you have to, you, the, the, the goal is to purchase capacity to cover the peak workload, right? So you, you buy a bunch of computers to make sure that you can handle all the, all the demand you have at sort of Christmas time or whatever, right? If you're selling widgets on the web. Okay. And so you might under provision. And so you think, oh, well, that's, that's bad, but I, I, should, I, just, I just should have, I didn't do planning properly. I should have just, uh, you know, bought more capacity, so I just made a mistake. But it's a little more insidious than that, right? Because you might be under-provisioned, but you don't know, right? Because customers come to your website and then sort of get turned away because it's a little bit busy, and they never come back. And so it ends up looking like, boy, we just planned perfectly, right? We're, 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 we're exactly at our peak capacity, when really you might have a lot more if you had more capacity. And so I think while this is a very business-oriented argument, I think the same thing might apply to the sort of paper deadline schedule of, of scientific research, right? There's a whole bunch of load all at once. People might decide to not do certain experiments because the machines are busy, right? They might decide to do a simpler experiment or something because the machines are busy. And so I think having infinite capacity might have an effect on the quality of the science being produced in, in a particular group as opposed to being constrained by whatever we already purchased, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, there's this automatic elastic scaling, which is kind of nice too. It's not quite as applicable here, but if you suddenly have more demand that you didn't expect, you don't have to do anything. Uh, and the, the example here was this goofy little company called Animoto that basically took pictures, a series of pictures, and would sort of set them to music and make a little narration out of them. And it was, you know, it's probably as close to useless as you can get, but, but it was popular. <laughs> and so they had, uh, they had 40 instances that, I shouldn't even say that, probably I'm being recorded, I guess, but. So, <laughs> for, for, <laughs> they had 40 computers or something that were managing all their workload. And then they had a, uh, uh, a relaunch of their Facebook app that made it sort of actually work properly. And so, you know, in the course, these are days, by the way, not like months or anything, right? So in, in the course of just a few days, they were going from 40 computers to uh, 5,000 computers at the peak, right? And so Amazon just sucked this up and was fine, right? They didn't have to do anything. And so that's not, you can't compete with that, really, uh, unless you're at the scale that Amazon and Microsoft and Google are. Um, another, another example of this that's maybe a little more realistic or actually a little more familiar to our world is not always just about sheer peak, right? It's about this kind of extreme periodicity. And so this was actually a trading house where these are uh, weekends, right? And so this gap is enormous. So trying to, trying to provision for the peak of this thing uh, is, is tough. But, but in, these, in these valleys, you're simply not paying for the instances, right? They, go, they drop back down, you, you pay a lot less, and then they go up and you pay more, and so on. And so being able, to, being able to have this elastic mapping of the workload to the resources needed has enormous savings for you in, in practice. Okay. Uh, so these are some visualizations. I, I, they're, they're actually interactive, and you can go on the web and the eScience website and, and check them out. These are some visualizations I did about the drop-in price of Amazon. So they, there's some evidence that they're not quite tracking Moore's Law, but they are you know, it's not staying fixed, right? So at, over time, they've had all sorts of announcements of various kinds of price drops, and the, 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 the slope is pretty, is pretty extreme. So having one EC2 unit, which is essentially like one, you know, one gigahertz processor, and, and there's all different ways to, to buy one of these units in different packaging, but normalized to, to one unit for a three-year period used to cost, you know, $2,500, and now costs like $500 within a span of, of just a couple of years, right? And so you can do the same thing with storage, the price of one terabyte in green for, to store it for one month and the price of one petabyte in, in orange. And definitely people do store petabytes on Amazon, by the way. It's expensive, no, you know, most scientists don't. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, there's, they're, 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 the, prices are, the prices are tracking pretty well with, with technology improvements. They, are, they, they appear to be passing the savings on to you, as, so they say. Okay, so an aside about costs, 
before I get to the sort of bottom line about what, what, what can be afforded and what can't, what really needs to be addressed is this university accounting practices that make, this, make these cost calculations not come out right. So computing equipment, capital expenditure, incurs no indirect costs, right? So if you spend $5,000, you can just put a server in your server room, and the university doesn't tax that at all. So when, when, but as soon as you plug that in, it's taking power, it takes cooling, it takes thermal capacity, it takes uh, some administration that might be paid by the department, and so on. So there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't incur over, you know, indirect cost overhead to help pay for all that stuff. But it doesn't because it's considered a capital expenditure. Services, however, uh, are charged the full indirect cost load, which at UW is 54 percent. It's like a, I think it's 100 percent at Stanford. And so, so cloud computing counts as a service. So every dollar I take in of grant money and I pass it over to Amazon, 54 cents has to go to the, go to the university for nothing, right? It just goes directly through them, and there's nobody that has to do anything. And so even with this complete, you know, apples to oranges comparison, it still works out to be a lot cheaper on Amazon because of that utilization trick, right? If you're not, if you're not going to slam it up there around 90% utilization, it's, it's usually going to turn out to be cheaper. But if you fix this, it's going to be a slam dunk in a lot of cases. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a while before they fix this, though. It's going to have to work. You have to have the funding agencies putting pressure on uh, the universities and the universities having to fix their sort of internal accounting practices and, and vice versa. Uh, but anyway, so the, the recommendation is to encourage you guys to bring this up to, to CTOs at universities and, and ask them the question about how, how this is handled. Does that make sense? Does anybody encounter that with their own grants? Yeah. Okay. Do people, do people encounter this problem that people tried to use uh, the cloud and sort of run into how much it caught, you know? No, not so much. How many people, how many people have used uh, so Microsoft or Amazon or Google, some of these cloud stuff? Also, not very many. But you guys know vaguely about it? More so? Uh, some, uh, okay. I guess I'm suffering from the no responses. So it's <laughs> difficult to interpret. Okay, so the bottom line on cost is, uh, yeah, if your utilization is high, which it can be, right? And a lot of times these computational science uh, labs, you can be constantly running jobs in some cases, right? So if you can do that, it might be better to buy your, your uh, equipment and store it locally. The other use case that, that requires local equipment probably is when you're doing, you want to store a lot of data for a long time and not really touch it much, right? Archival data storage is pretty expensive on Amazon. You, you're paying for sort of the massive redundancy and it's always sort of online and it's always very sort of low latency, well, sort of low latency, you know, reasonably high performance and so on. Um, and you're paying all, all that stuff you're paying for through the nose, and you don't need it. Um, this may change at some point. All they have to do is offer a tape storage for rent, and all of a sudden this, this would change. But right now, it's not. I, I can't find a way to make it cost effective to store big amounts of data uh, for, for archive purposes. Okay. And then you can you can. There's a nice little pricing calculator for Amazon. I think there's a similar tool for for uh, Microsoft about different kind of application scenarios, and you sort of plug in what you want, and you can get a get a cost out. The, the other thing, I didn't put a slide on this, I probably should have though. The other thing I think is, is nice about this is that, I was talking to this with uh, Tiffany I think yesterday, it, it exposes the true costs of your, of your computing to the researcher who are actually doing it, as opposed to sort of hiding it behind layers of, of university accounting. And I think this is kind of a good thing because it makes you sort of, I mean not, not, just, not just to save cost overall, but it makes you sort of be aware of, uh, you know, which experiments you should be running and which ones you shouldn't be running, right? It's not. Well, anyway, we can, we, can, we can talk about that, but I think that's a, that's a, that's a side effect. It, overall, it's a le less wasted effort. Yeah. Just as, you started yeah. out by saying that one of the nice things about computational science is that experiments are free. Yeah, I did. Now, now you're going to charge me for every you, 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 experiment that my grad student runs into another well, book. But my, I guess, I guess I've shifted hats, so now I'm looking at it as, as there is a cost to doing those uh, things. So I guess you know what it was? The free was uh, the development time to sort of change a variable and hit go, it's, it's just that simple. You hit the change variable and hit go. The actual cost of running it, if it's a, if it's a massive job, uh, has to be paid by somebody. And right now, you just don't, you don't notice or you don't care. And I think that's, I think that's, that's sort of a benefit of, of exposing it. Does that make sense? So it's sort of cost in labor to the, per, to the developer versus cost in computing infrastructure is the, is the distinction between earlier and now. Yeah. Um, so another aside, this is maybe a bit of a plug to this research project that we just got funded that we're, that we're working on, but we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at pricing data, right? And this is a computing in the cloud initiative from, uh, there's a partnership between NSF and Microsoft, and this is uh, on the Azure platform. And so, you know, it's an unpopular idea, especially maybe among this crowd, but, you know, 
can we sell access to data? Right, what, 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 how can, can we do that in a, in a very principled way? And there are, these things actually exist. There's an Azure data market. Uh, there's a, a company called InfoChimps. Uh, there's a few, a few other of these things that are actually looking for. You give us your data, we'll repost it for you, and people can buy it, and we'll, we'll give you back some of the proceeds to it. So why is this an unpopular idea? Well, it's, it's not very open, right? This, this sort of goes against the, the open access thing. But it might be required, right? It's becoming clear that we can't actually store everything we want to store. There's just too much of it. And I can, if you don't buy that, I can show you some other slides uh, offline. And so maybe there needs to be a little bit of thought about what's the important data, and maybe important can be defined as sort of heavily used or of interest to a lot of people, uh, and what's not. And so if things are, are worth more to, worth to more people, it's easier to amortize the cost of that storage among, among people. And this is a way to sort of level set that a little bit, right? Oh, I'll put my data online, but, but we're all going to share the cost of paying for it if it's, if it's so important to you, right? As opposed to me having to shoulder everything. Another thing is beyond money, uh, one of the reasons why I, was, why I sort of was interested in this project is it might be that the value models we come up with, and we're sort of looking at this, uh, there's sort of two sides. There's a systems project and there's a very theoretical project that we're, that we're working on. But the value models we come up with on the theoretical side, for example, may be useful to formalize attribution requirements as well as money, right? It's all about the value of the data. And so maybe, this is, we're still early in the project, I don't know any of this yet, I'm waving my hands, but if I use your data in my research, you know, I'm charged in some units. And so minimal usage is maybe free, but at some threshold, a citation is expected. At some other threshold, an acknowledgement is expected. And maybe even at some threshold above that, co-authorship is expected, right? And if we can put this on a firm foundation where we actually make this you know, precise and, and principled and sort of, you know, prove properties about, about the pricing function that we think are desirable as opposed to just sort of doing it ad hoc, uh, that, could be, that could be a pretty powerful incentive to opening up data that right now is too much trouble to, to make open. Does that make sense? Okay. So finally, let's see, I'm, I'm not sure how much time I have. Anybody know? I'll keep going until somebody else. So, Data intensive experiments are a little different. So it's not just a bunch of VMs, it's also these massive data sets that have to be stored somewhere. So the observation here is that, you know, FTP is, is, is not useful anymore, I claim. Stop using it, right? It takes days to transfer a terabyte over the internet, and it's not even likely to, to succeed. And copying a petabyte is, is, is essentially impossible, right? You, once, wherever it is, that's where it's staying. It's never going to move again. So the, the implicate, a consequence of this, I claim, is that if you believe that the cloud is getting more popular, which I sort of provided a little bit of evidence that it is, it's going to become increasingly true that data is born into the cloud and it just stays there. And so we better figure out how to use that to process the data as opposed to shipping things around from system to system to do different things with it, right? And so this is a chronic problem in the visualization community, I think. I talk a lot with uh, uh, Juliana and the, and the group she works with about, you know, there's these visualization systems they're specially designed to sort of throw data through the GPU as, as quickly as possible. And then there's some other system that actually runs the simulation. And then there's some other system that actually does the data analysis. And the cost of moving it between these, even if it is local, is dominating the cost of actually doing the computation anymore. And so you have to figure out how to make combined systems that can do it all, unfortunately. You know, we, we'd like to be able to do this specialized stuff, but you, but you simply can't afford to move it around. And so the cloud seems to be a good candidate for doing all of it. And that's one of the, that's one of the areas of my research is trying to figure out how to do visualization stuff on the cloud, even though it's not a very good platform for that. Okay, so the only solution here is to push the computation to the data rather than data push the data computation. You gotta upload your code rather than download the data, okay? Uh, I'll sort of skip this. This is, I like databases, All right? So, so scripts and files, I understand that they're necessary in many cases, but whenever possible, I wanna try to, I, I'm, I'm tired of seeing Python scripts that are 400 lines that essentially implement a, a two-line SQL query, right? This, this happens a lot, and I'm trying to get rid of that. So uh, in that, to that end, I have this project, this database is a service for science called SQL Share. This runs on, on Microsoft SQL Azure platform. Uh, it's, there's, a, <laughs> there's a bit of a problem with it last night, so assume, assumably it's up and running right now. <laughs> but uh, but it's, been, it's been pretty robust overall. We have, we have a fair amount of users using it. Uh, you can log in with your UWNet ID, we can also, which of course many of you don't have. You can also log in with a Google ID. And actually, the UWNet ID stuff is connected through Shibboleth, so you could actually wire in other universities' uh, single sign-on systems without too much trouble, so they tell me, if we, wanted, if we wanted to expand this out. So what can you do with this thing? Well, you upload files, and if they're essentially rows and columns, it'll try to interpret the rows and columns and make it a table in the database. So this basically skips the step, the painful step of schema design, if anybody uses databases. You don't have to actually sort of draw ER diagrams on the whiteboard and sort of figure out the model for your data. You just upload the files and start querying them right away. So we're trying to make it more like it is on your local file system where you're just writing scripts, but allow you to use SQL over it. Okay, and so every, every 
every data set can, you can derive a query, save it, and then that, the result of that query can, can then be queried by other people as a, as a base table, if that makes sense, because notion of views. So this is nice. It, it enables sharing. It sort of simplifies it. It reduces the amount of code you have to do. It's all available on the web. Uh, why do we choose SQL? Why is SQL a good, decent language for this? Um, maybe with this crowd, I mean, I'm driving into this too much, but we find that it's sort of necessary and sufficient. This auto advances getting me. Um, we find this sort of necessary and sufficient. It's, it's necessary uh, because there's these, so you can't dumb it down to, to sorry, this is distracting. Let me slow down. What you'll often see is, is simpler interfaces allow you to do simple filtering on a particular attribute, right? So a single column, <laughs> a, single co a, a single column at a time or something. I don't know what's going on. I guess it's, uh, I actually do know what's going on. I pasted in a slide from one talk that was timed and it's poisoned the rest of them in some sense and made them all auto advance, I guess. Um, let, let, me, let, me, let me be brief. There's, there's questions that people want to ask that we find very organically in practice. We're not inventing them that can be expressed in SQL but cannot be expressed in some of these dumbed down GUIs. And so we're actually sort of trying to consider maybe it's feasible to actually ask people to actually write directly in SQL even though it's sort of a foreign language and so on. And we have some success with it, right? We have people that don't really do any programming at all that are sort of picking it up and are able to write queries and share them with each other and so on. And so that's, that was actually a little surprising to us, but it, it seems to be working. And so she hates when I use this picture, but I, when, she, when she bought the book, I was excited, so I had to take a picture of it. Okay, this is a biologist, and she's really smart. I'm trying to say she's <laughs> not, but it's just not her background to sort of do a lot of programming. Okay, so the basic model is pretty simple. You upload data, you can query it, and you can share it with people, and that's fine. Uh, there's also kind of, it's also kind of a research platform. We try to look at some of these very sophisticated features. Just because we reduce the problem to one of writing SQL doesn't mean that it's totally solved, right? SQL is still pretty hard to write. So we, uh, so we do things like, uh, you know, can you autocomplete a SQL query? Can you start writing this SQL and have it, look at the logs that came before that and say, well, most people that started off the query this way tended to finish it this other way. Maybe you want to do that too, make it a little easier. There's a little bit of work on English to SQL. Uh, recently uh, in, in Sigmod, we gave a demo of this automatic starter query. So this is, this is kind of fun, right? This is, this is take a whole bunch of data with unknown relationships that you're not very familiar with, upload it, and have it automatically suggest back some reasonable queries to, to sort of hook things together and, and join things up. And it seems to do a pretty good job, at least in some applications. And so what we're trying to do here is help you get started writing SQL without having to uh, look at a blinking cursor and go read the documentation, right? Have some examples to work from for free. Uh, visualization, so many people, you know, when, once, once you convince them to write a query or two, the first thing they want to do is make scatter plots of their results and so on. So we have a little tool to help make that a little easier as well um, and some other stuff. There's some usage for this. It's only about eight months old. We've done essentially zero advertising except maybe in a talk like this occasionally. Uh, people around UW campus and some externally some of these numbers are a little bit old, but lots of tables, lots of views derived, which I think is important. This is the key idea, right, is that you're, you, you write a query and you save it, um, uh, save it for other people to use. And so the fact that those are being created suggests that that's, that's working. Uh, lots of queries executed. Nothing really big here. This isn't really about scalable data. I, talk, I, I opened the section talking about big data. This is not really about big data. This is about sort of taking your spreadsheets and your small files and getting them in a more organized way uh, as opposed to petabytes. Uh, okay. I can't wrap up like right now, yeah, almost done. So, uh, you know, moving back up to, to really large data, distributed computation is hard, so it's not just a matter of, here's my R script, now scale it up to, you know, three orders of magnitude more data. That's, that's, there's sort of a whole different problem to solve there. Uh, VMs aren't enough, so what's, what's available in the cloud that I think is pretty compelling is that there's native services available for processing big data. So, for example, with Amazon, they have this elastic MapReduce. How many people have heard of MapReduce? Okay, so a lot of you. So, how many people have heard of Elastic MapReduce? Okay, so what Elastic MapReduce is essentially is a, is a native Hadoop environment that you can take any data that you have already uploaded to Amazon and you can process it with, with, uh, with, with Hadoop without having to install Hadoop software or manage your Hadoop cluster or whatever. That's nice. They just save you a little bit of trouble. It's nothing, it's not magical. Um, but that's the, kind of, that's the kind of trend that I, I, I think is going to make this a more compelling platform than any other, right? Is the fact that they're going to they're going to be providing these other services that you didn't have to build that allow you to process your data, and then there's languages on top of MapReduce that make it a little more palatable in practice. There's sort of a language called Pig that's essentially relational algebra. If you don't know what the relational algebra is, then that probably doesn't help. But uh, it's, it's it simplifies MapReduce, uh, and then Hive allows you to write SQL queries and it gets compiled down into these big MapReduce jobs. And that was originally from Facebook, but they're both open source projects. 
Okay, so other things here, there's uh, different capabilities. There's sort of whether, whether, how expressive they are. So these MapReduce and relational algebra-like and SQL-like are probably the most expressive. There's some things that are just sort of look up and filter. And I actually took out the slide where I defined these more precisely. But the point is that everybody, all the players sort of are, are starting to provide these capabilities, right? They're, they're providing big data query services. So it goes beyond just you have to write your own code, put it into a VM and process everything. There's some native services available to you. And I think this is a good thing. Okay, so this is the last slide. So cloud is mainstream. You should try it. Get your computing out of the closet. Uh, create VMs for other people to use them. Maybe cite them, right, in a paper. Say, here's the Amazon machine image that has my entire crime scene that I did for this paper. It's not, the clean, it's not as clean as many of the proposals we've seen in this workshop, but where, where it actually has, you know, everything's kind of reproducible and the provenance is there for querying and so on. It's a very sort of dirty method, and I, you know, I appreciate that. However, it kind of works for anything, right? No matter what kind of crazy shit you're doing, <laughs> you, you, can, you, you can save a VM, right? And you can post it and you can cite it. So it's at least catching that, that bottom tier, right? I'm sort of worried, I mean, some, the, the last talk sort of made this point of I'm worried about the people that aren't in this room, that aren't being very conscientious about this stuff. If you start off your work in a VM, at any given time, you can just hit Control S in a sense, right? And get a, get a snapshot of it and then cite it. And I think that would still be a far cry above where we, where we seem to be nowadays. Okay, so I, well, I guess one way to look at it is while other people are sort of pushing the forward edge, I'm sort of <laughs> pulling up the caboose or something, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so for data intensive experiments, it's still not 100% clear if you actually have 100 terabytes that you're doing your work on, you know, shipping it up to Amazon and having to pay for that in, in per perpetuity uh, just for reproducibility's sake, that's going to be hard to get funding for probably, and you know, that, that's still pretty expensive. Uh, but you're also not likely to do too much better yourself. If you try to host it, host it locally, it's, it's also very expensive. Uh, prices are dropping, new services are coming all the time. You know, mention this to CTOs about this, this charging overhead on cloud services. And then, and then maybe going back to being provocative, I think in 10 years everything will be, really, will be in the cloud. I, I really think that you won't, you, you know, you'll have your sort of tablet device and you'll sort of connect to your servers that, that are provisioned for you, but there won't be any sort of cases with spinning fans that you'll see ever again. Um, and so this is, this is not a good quote to use. So anybody, so anybody know what, who was alleged to say this? Who? No. Tom Watson. Lot, Tom Watson was alleged to say it, but actually people looked into it and they're not, there's not a lot of evidence that he actually did say it. <laughs> Howard Aiken did say something. Howard, I see. Okay, good. So that, that helps me get the provenance right. So I was trying to look at it. Hey, some... Howard Aiken said something very similar. I see. So I think, I think what the, the joke I guess I'm making is that maybe, the, maybe this is a true statement, right? It's just that, you know, the computers are one at Amazon, one at Microsoft, one at Google, <laughs> and that's all, the, that's all the computers that we'll all really need. Okay, so that's it. Amazon did, does allow you to rent Tesla clusters now as of about eight months ago or something, which is pretty amazing, right? Because it's not too cost effective to buy your own Tesla cluster just to try it out and see if it's going to help you or not. But now you don't have to. You can go rent one, see if it actually improves your algorithm, see if it makes things faster, and then decide to buy one for yourself later or not. And so they, they cost a fair amount, but, they're, but it's, it's, it's certainly more affordable to buy now, right? So you can't do GPUs. The other thing they offered is a HPC clusters. They, you can buy a, a cluster of Nehalem uh, connected with InfiniBand. And so theoretically, this might allow you to do sort of uh, computational fluid dynamics, for example, that, that need, need a lot of tight coupling. It used to be true that if you, you spun up 10 instances in the cloud, they could be on different racks, they could be on different servers, and so forth. So it was just totally impossible to do anything. They required a lot of fast network between them, but, but, they, but, they, but they addressed that. And so it also shows the trend that they're responding to customers and they're sort of thinking about how to make it more useful. I think it's good. First question. Uh, I'm sort of making all that up right now. I don't really know what the right way to be, and, I, and I'd love some feedback on that. If, may, maybe there's no amount of data usage that should justify co-authorship. Um, that, 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 that could be the case. I don't know. But somehow, somehow charging, charging for usage and something other than money, I guess, is the general idea. And then specifically, there's a lot of details to work out. I don't know, I don't know the right way to do that. Okay.